global uh, health budget was spent on 90% um, of disease burden. That means only that means 90% of the budget was only solving 10% of the rich, the diseases of the rich. All the other 90% of the diseases, they, there's no medicine because all the big pharma companies do not want to create medicines for this. Why? Because they think they won't have a paying customer, right? So that is a problem that cannot be ignored, right? Like all these um, unheard of, unpronounceable, <laughs> or difficult to pronounce diseases, right? These are all prolific um, you know, diseases in Africa, but there's no medicine. So she, she came out of that whole system and proved the model wrong. So she found new customers in governments and in foundations to kind of um, you know, buy these uh, remedies for this type of diseases. Okay, um, this guy, his name is Christopher Columbus, for real. He lives in Catalonia, the, the state where Barcelona is from, and he's a psychiatrist. He was in a mental hospital with 200 over crazy people, right? And he's always frustrated by how the crazy patients are treated as if they're stupid. And it's like, they're not stupid, they still can work, they need that sense of belonging. In fact, many of them are crazy because they're too smart. Right, so he, he got so frustrated, he, he set up a yogurt factory and he employed all his 200 crazy people and hired some normal managers and trained them. And today, La Fageda, which is the premium yogurt brand, has the third largest market share in Catalonia after Nestle and Danone. It's a for-profit uh, social enterprise, but at the core of it is a social mission. He has proven that an employment model of the marginalized community of disabled people can, can work. Right? And when you go to Barcelona and when you buy La Fagera, you wouldn't know that it's, you, it, it wouldn't be bought out of sympathy. It's just a freaking good premium yogurt. Right? And so, um, yeah, I think their revenues are hitting 15 million or something per year. Um, so this is another example of a social entrepreneur who proved that disabled people can be employed. And a good friend in Bombay also um, um, employs the deaf to deliver courier, uh, courier services, to deliver parcels. Why? Can anyone tell me why? Why did he employ the deaf to be postmen? Postmen. They, they don't need to see. Yes. They're not bothered by the postman. <laughs> they're not bothered by the traffic jam in India. <laughs> um, anyone else? One week free co-working at the hub. <laughs> Give it a try. I have only ten minutes. Yep. I guess uh, when one of the senses is bad, the other senses. They exactly. For the deaf, their spatial sensory is higher. They don't get lost as we do, or as girls do. <laughs> and my friend, my friend actually visited their, uh, it's called Miracle Couriers. If you want any of these contacts or be connected to any of these founders, just let me know. Um, you know, my friend went to their office in Bombay and they cried. It was 100 employees, but it's just quiet. It's just a hustle bustle of paper, no office politics. People were just working quietly. Um, <laughs> amazing, right? So, so, so social entrepreneurship is also not, um, it's not pure traditional charity and NGOs because they have a revenue and entrepreneurial approach to things. They're not just reliant to, on um, donation. It is not philanthropy because philanthropists generally make a lot of money first and then when they are 40, 50 or 60, they give back a, a chunk and they don't really care about the impact, right? So Bill Gates, for example, is a philanthropist turned social entrepreneur. When he quit his Microsoft job and went down to the ground, he was a full-fledged social entrepreneur. You get the difference? And he, start, he, he started, uh, he's still a philanthropist, he started the world's biggest foundation with $50 billion with his wife, Melinda, right? It is also not social services where, let's say, I go to an old folks home on a Saturday and I read a story to um, an, an, um, uh, an, an old um, lady, right? That's all really, really good and that's normally how the seeds are planted and it's really, really important to have. But um, those will not change the system, right? Those are small, meaningful actions, but um, you, know, you need a lot of that to, to change the system. It is also not corporate social responsibility because um, the intention is dubious when a company does CSR. So at the end of the day, whoop, whoop, um, of course not traditional uh, for-profit co companies. At the end of the day, what social entrepreneurship is, it, it is a mindset. It is an approach of how you do things, okay? Um, it is, um, it is that, that good intention and that pure intention to do good, but using all the business acumen that you have to, to get there as well. 
Okay, so this is a spectrum that kind of compares, um, that shows you the spectrum from a traditional for-profit to traditional non-profit. And you have this new hybrid world in the center right now that is called social enterprise, where it is both mission and um, um, it is it is both driven by mission, but you also want to be financially sustainable because recognizing the fact that if you're not fi financially sustainable, you are not mission sustainable as well. Um, so moving on into the real topic, right? This is a map of um, the global poverty and the concentration of the poor in the world. These are people who live below two dollars a day. Um, Singapore, of course, is not part of this because Singapore is going is predicted to be the world's wealthiest nation in 2050 right we are doing quite well so what do we solve in Singapore right if we don't have graphic poverty people lying on the streets hobo problems right um, we'll get to that um, this is a this is a new report fresh from the oven uh, from Bain and Company that you know that big consulting firm, and they have identified eight uh, growth areas that are trillion dollars and above uh, leading to 2020, and their number one is there a laser? Oh, their number one kind of um, area growth that they have identified that is worth 10 trillion dollars is the next billion customers. These next billion customers are people who live in emerging countries who are emerging into the middle class of the social economic uh, ladder, right? So a lot of these people have not been served by the, by the products and services that we often take for granted for, right? So it is a huge untapped market and, and do we want to include them into our lifestyle, into our economic um, behaviors and all that? Um, you know, it's, it's a question mark. Right, uh, it's it's uh, you know you can get into a, a big philosophical debate on, on why yes and no, but in general they do want to uh, improve on their quality of life and lifespan and all that, and so therefore um, whoever who can crack the uh, conundrum of um, innovating to be cheap enough to be sold to these markets but still gain a profit to be sustainable will will make a quite quite a good sum. So in, in Singapore, um, the top four models are um, commonly used. So work and work integration model is where you include um, it's inclusive employment, right? Whether it's for the aged or the disabled or any marginalized communities into, into a venture, the Christopher Columbus uh, model. The plowback profit model is when you have, you have a venture, you make surpluses, which shows that you're doing well as a business, but you decide to put a, most or all of these profits back into the mission and into the business. Okay, um, which if you put all of these profits back, that means you are a non-profit. Whether you're a non, I get this question all the time, right? This is my fourth speaking engagement this week. And in each one, everyone will ask, are you, you know, is a social enterprise a non or for-profit? Do you know the answer? It can be both, okay? The important thing is it, it's the mission. And the difference between a non or for-profit is just simply whether you declare dividends or not. If you are a for-profit social enterprise, that means you do declare some dividends from your profits to your shareholders. If you are a non-profit, you can still make profits, but you put back into the company. Is that, does that make sense? Cool. Uh, a subsidized service model is where when you charge the poor, uh, you charge the rich and you use the extra margins to serve the poor. It's called the Robin Hood model. Yeah, makes sense? A uh, social needs model is when, you know, essentially the, the core of your business model and of the venture is social in itself. Um, and just now I've touched on base of the pyramid. Base of the pyramid um, is taken from a book by CK Prahalad, Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid. It, he just says that you know there are four billion people who live under two dollars a day, and if you're innovative enough, you can actually tap on this market and at the same time increase the uh, quality of life of these four billion people out of six billion ish. Um, these are some of the ecosystem builders in Singapore. 
um, in the social enterprise space, including the Grammy Creative Lab, which is under the amazing uh, leadership of Professor Wong Pokam here. And um, the GCL and, and US Enterprise also collaborate and work together with the hub to grow the ecosystem more. So there's a lot of collaboration happening, um, and so that's the good thing to push this um, field forward. Um, just on a side note, there are you know there's a there's a international organization program office within the Economic Development Board, the EDB, whose mission is to draw in all these amazing international organizations, IOs, nonprofits into Singapore to create that soul and heart for Singapore. And so right now, there are, I think that there are already more than 140 of these organizations. And if you want to volunteer, um, you know, get to know this space much more through through very um, established brands worldwide like save the children and operation smiles and WWF you can you can you can get to them you can come to me to get to them as well if you don't have a direct contact um, there are also many social change events in Singapore. I took this from the Lian Center. Um, like I said, even at the hub, there are three to five events per week. Imagine that, right? It ranges from impact investing funds coming to talk about how they invest in social enterprises to amazing social entrepreneurs who are providing sanitary pads to India. Because once you have sanitary pads, girls' education become better. They are more confident. They are, uh, you know, they are they are included in the employment model. So sanitary sanitary pack to many social entrepreneurs is one key thing that uh, that you know it's a theory of change right um, so to impact from impact investors to that to the head the former head of UBS philanthropy services they, so all these amazing people come in to talk um, because we are all uh, like-minded in that way we want more people to get to know this field um, because it is a nice hybrid where you can make meaning and money at the same time and you can pursue your passion and your purpose and still have profits at the same time if you wish to right it is a long gone now the days where where it's either or right you either have a good salary or you do good for the world sometimes when people see me after like trying to get a meeting they will be like oh my god I expected to see you in like rags and poor clothes and and I'm like which generation are you from right it's it's um it's really a, a, a new world and there are many um, good universities who are actually even um, providing social entrepreneurship as, a, as an MBA as a program as a, as a course and a lot of governments as well are creating policies tax infrastructures legal infrastructures to help this hybrid new new hybrid model to be legitimate Oops. Okay. So in Singapore, there are all these um, different issue areas that you can get to work on. And another question that, that I often get is, how do I know what my passion is? I can't answer that for you, right? But very often, um, some, some people find their passion by having a personal pain point a very personal pain point that they want to solve. You know, they could be having a sibling who is deaf, they can be having a dad who has a stroke, they can be, you know, it, it's a very personal thing and you feel so strongly and so, you know, so strong enough that you can do something about it. Um, other people, um, just feel like it's just injustice if some uh, communities are marginalized and they want to do something about it. Um, but a good proxy is that if I ask you in five years time, who are the people you want to hang out with, right? To have conversations with. Sometimes that question helps you find out um, your areas of interest and passion because you do want to hang out and spend a lot of time with people you like to hang out with. And very often, these are people who are like-minded uh, with you in that space. But um, I would... <laughs> You're helping me, okay. Yep, yep, next. I would also encourage though that because Singapore does not have crazy graphic poverty problems, um, we do have first world problems, what I call as first world problems, you know, where, where you know, national progress has sometimes sacrificed individual courage and individualism in general. So um, if you want to help in that front, you can think about ideas that can help people live by their passion and be creative even from a young age and not be afraid to live by their passion from a young age um, to kind of 
really give people the courage to be honest to themselves and really think about their purpose and what they want to do in the world and not just follow the flow of becoming a banker or, or an oil trader or a broker not that those are not good but it's not for everyone but what a, what an economy does typically is to make everyone think that that's for everyone because that's good for the economy right but Singapore has reached the stage where it is okay and now it wants entrepreneurship it wants innovation and it wants people who come alive because then the nation comes alive you know it, the nation is made out of people anyways and and finally um, I, I, you know this is my thing like self emergence it is a very hard thing to do and recently I wrote an article for the Guardian saying that self emergence really depends on many ecosystem factors including the people you hang out with um, your family the the city your neighborhood the country so if we can all kind of um, recognize the importance of being honest with ourselves and um, and doing good for the world from a young age that would be cool yep so these are some books that you can read to kind of follow up on uh, on this field beyond this talk um, and yeah, this was the uh, article that I wrote for The Guardian, uh, which was published last, week, last month. It, it, it is about Singapore, and I've shared uh, some personal pain stories around it and uh, how we're solving it right now. And I'm, I'm contactable through here, and I'm always, I'm every day at the hub if I'm not traveling for business. Um, so that's my Twitter handle, if you want to follow me on Twitter. Um, 